Okay, so you should be seeing my um, using Google Forms um, slide right now. Um, welcome. Um, we get about an hour to get through this. Uh, we had a session like this yesterday, and that seemed a pretty good amount of time to cover the, the content that I've got here. Um, let's jump right in. So how do you open up Google Forms in the first place? Um, you need to be logged into your Google account. Um, so it could be just as simple as being in your Gmail window. Um, there's several ways you can start up a new Google form. Uh, the way that I recommend is that you go to your Google Drive and start it from there. So um, if you're not familiar how to get to Drive, if you're in your Gmail window, for example, looking at your messages and stuff like that, in the upper right-hand corner of that window is the Google Apps button. From there, you can go to Drive. And then what I suggest you do is go to the folder that um, you want this um, Google form to be saved in, as well as any of the responses that you might get to the form. Because um, at one point, or at some point, you're going to probably want those responses to show up into a Google Sheet, so you can do all kinds of analysis on the data um, and use it in a lot of different ways. So my recommendation is go to Google Drive, go to the folder you want the, the form to be stored in, and then um, from there, and let me open up mine here, um, go to the trainings folder, and I have a sign up forms folder in my trainings folder. So this is where my um, Google Forms for these different sessions that I've been offering, uh, where I've created each of those. So now I would just go to new. Google Forms is kind of hidden. It's not right on the main menu. So you got to go down here to more. And then I've got Google Forms that I can select. So that's one of the ways that you can uh, start a new Google Form up. You can also just go right to the Google Apps button. So that could be, again, from your email. You'd have to scroll way down. It's kind of hidden in here, too. And you can see Forms is available there. Or I could just literally go to a new browser tab and go to forms.google.com. And that would also take me to Google Forms. So those are the three most common ways. Um, again, I recommend that you start it from Google Drive just so that you know right where it's going to be so you can get back to it in the future and um, easily find what you're looking for. Uh, let me close this up. So what is Google Forms in the first place? Um, it's really a data collection tool. It's a lot like SurveyMonkey. Uh, if you've ever heard of that, you've probably been invited to you know, respond to a Google Form before. Obviously, I know you have because you somehow signed up for this class, and I used the Google Form for, for that purpose. Um, it's very easy to use, um, both for the person that's responding as well as for you to create the form in the first place. Um, it's uh, free for you as part of your Google Apps for Education account, um, and it allows for unlimited responses. Uh, one of the things I don't think I mentioned on this slide is that um, the time window on a form can be whatever you want it to be. So for example, um, you know, at this point, pretty much my sign-up form for these sessions you know, after today, I really don't need it anymore. So I could turn it off um, or I could just leave it out there. I could delete it, whatever I want to do with it. But you can also have really an open-ended time frame. So um, as REMC director, some of the things that we have available for people to, to borrow from REMC, I have a form that you can go to our website and click on, and then you just fill it out and say, hey, I want to borrow the Spheros, or I want to borrow the Dashbot, or whatever. Um, that really has an open-ended time frame. So I've had it open for multiple years. Um, it'll stay open you know, as long as, uh, as long as Google Forms exists and as long as we've got the stuff to check out. So um, you don't have to feel like there's a certain you know, start time and a certain stop time to um, form collection either. Um, they can range from being very, very simple, like I'm going to create a very simple one with you today, maybe, you know, inviting people to a family reunion kind of a thing. Maybe it's a simple survey of your students of who has internet access, who has a computer at home, that kind of stuff. Or it can get very complex. By complex, I mean that you can build logic into it so that if they answer yes to this question, then it goes down this path. If they answer no, it takes a completely different path of questioning. Um, 
think about the old school books where, you know, uh, you get to the end of a chapter and you get to decide, you know, what the character in the book does. Well, if they do this, then turn to page 35. If they do this other thing, turn to page 60. Um, same kind of concept here. You can build logic into the form um, to make sure that it's customized to whatever the, the responses are that the person is giving you. Um, the responses themselves, I say they're automatically analyzed. All I really mean by that is when you go and look at your responses after they've been collected, it'll give you a summary page and we'll take a look at that summary a little bit later that'll automatically build some charts for you, some pie charts or bar graphs or whatever. Um, so, you know, it automatically does all that work for you. You don't have to, to do that if you don't want to, but you can do a much deeper analysis on your data if it warrants because it allows you to open the raw data up with Google Sheets. Um, and if you wanted to, then you could download it and use it in, in Excel, but Sheets should do the same thing essentially. This another bullet here really doesn't belong. That was me messing around with uh, another class earlier. So let me get rid of that. So that's kind of Google Forms in a nutshell. So let's talk about how to design one. We already talked about how to start up uh, Google Forms. If I flip over to the new form that it gave me, I can see that automatically it kind of gives me a heading box here, just calls it untitled form. And this is meant to have me fill in um, whatever the heading or the subject of my um, survey or my form is gonna be. I can put in a description if I want to, it's totally optional. Um, And that can be, again, as much or as little as I want it to be. Let me zoom in on this a little bit to make it a little easier for you to see. And then it automatically gives me one question to start with. So untitled question, it's uh, the choice of multiple choice with one option. So I'd literally just click there and I would type in whatever my question's going to be. So probably what we want to know on almost every survey is who's, at, who's responding, unless it's anonymous, right? Notice that when I typed that in, it automatically has some intelligence built into it. It automatically changed the question type from multiple choice to short answer. I can see here where the, the person would be able to put in their answer when they uh, were completing the survey. Down below here, I've got a few things where I can duplicate the question if I wanted to. I can delete it. I can make it required. So something like your name probably want it to be required unless it's optional of course it's up to you and then I've also got this little set of three dots now we're going to come back to it a little later but this is basically more options that you can um, assign to that particular question but those options will change based on the type of question that you've asked so like I said we'll come back to that in a little bit so I've got my first basic question here we probably want to ask more than just what their name is so over here on the right, on the top of this little toolbar, I've got the plus to add another question. So I would just simply click on that plus, and I get the same exact type of question box as I had on the first one. So maybe we want to know, are you planning to attend? I don't know why I keep spelling it that way. It, again, use some intelligence. It left it as a multiple choice type of response. It even gave me some suggested options. I can choose yes, I can choose no, or maybe. Or if I wanna give the people that are responding all three of those, I could just click add all, and it'll automatically fill in all three of those as the possible responses that the people can pick from, okay? If I don't want to maybe allow them to be wishy-washy, I either need to know you're coming or you're not. I could come over here on the far right and say, we're not giving you any maybe option. I can X that out and it'll take it off the list. If after thinking about it, I decide Meh, maybe I should put it back, I can just simply click on add option and type it in again. Or maybe in these days, we would add something like that. Okay, so I can add as many options as I want just by continually click clicking down here and um, adding, 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 and then I can remove any that I don't want after the fact, okay? Again, 
I need to make a decision. Do I want that to be required or not? I'm going to add another question. Maybe this time, if they are attending, we want to know, what are you going to bring? Okay. It, again, is trying to guess for me. Um, it thinks that I maybe want this to be a checkbox. I'm going to leave it that way, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So maybe we'll give them some options of uh, meat or salad. Okay, so we'll build some options like that. Now, let's talk for a second. What's the difference between this question, which was multiple choice, and this question, which was checkboxes? We can see, obviously, that the multiple choice are circles. The checkboxes are in squares. The key difference is this. Multiple choice, you get one choice. Check boxes, they could say, I'm going to bring meat and I'm going to bring salad and I'm going to bring veggies or any combination of them. Okay. So that's important to know when you're building this type of a survey. Um, are you going to allow them to give you multiple answers to the same question or not? Now, this thing could get um, long. Maybe we give them an a choice for other. Actually, there was a, a button I could click on to, to add other. So if it starts to get super long like this and, you know, you got to think about the, the people that are going to be responding to the survey, um, just think about yourself. As soon as you start to see a survey that looks like it's super long, the first thing you think of is, I'm not doing it. It's just going to take me too long. I'm not going through that process. So one of the things we could do um, to shorten it up even though it's the same number of questions, is we could change this question type from a checkbox maybe to a dropdown. We change it to a dropdown, it just gives me a numbered list. Um, you might say, well, that didn't really shorten it up any, even visually. In reality, for the person that's going to respond to it, though, they won't see the full list like this. They'll see it as a dropdown list. So let me show you up at the top of my screen here. I can click on this preview button, the little eyeball, and by previewing, I'm now able to see what it will look like to the person responding. So I can see the name question and see this little red asterisk. I can tell up here that that means that it's a required question. We made this one required. The what are you bringing choice suddenly, like I said, is now a drop down menu and they could pick from the list. Now, I don't know if you caught it, but notice I can only pick one choice. Or I could go back to choose, meaning I haven't picked anything. I'm going to be a freeloader and just show up and eat everybody else's food. Um, so that is something to be aware of, though. If you choose drop down, it's the same as a multiple choice from the standpoint that they're only able to pick one of the available options. So. I had actually changed from a checkbox type of a question to a drop down. And whether I knew it or not, that fundamentally changed the way that the people were able to respond to my question. So just something to be aware of. If I still wanted to use a drop down, but I still wanted them to be able to maybe bring more than one thing, I could do something like this. What if I change this back to drop down? We're going to make it required. We're going to force them to bring something. But we want them to be able to bring a second thing. So how about if I just duplicate that question? And maybe the second question, I'd say, what else are you bringing? Give them the same exact list, the same drop-down choice. But maybe this one I don't make required. We're going to make them bring something, but they don't necessarily have to bring two things. Make sense? So that's how we could kind of use that required, not required um, method. The other thing I'm going to let you know when you're dealing with checkboxes is when it comes to analyzing your data after the fact, if somebody selects multiple choices from a checkbox, all of those choices will show up in the same cell within the spreadsheet. So um, let me show you. If I go back to my sign up forms folder, 
and I show you the spreadsheet, the Google Sheet that was generated from the um, sign-up form that you guys filled out to take these classes. I had used a checkbox for you being allowed to pick, you know, I want to take this one, this one, this one, and this one. And some people just signed up for one, like Cindy signed up for just this one class. So in my spreadsheet, um, free screencasting tools, that was her only choice. It showed up all by itself in that cell in my spreadsheet. Unfortunately, though, when people signed up for more than one thing, let me see if I can zoom this down a little bit. When people signed up for more than one thing, oops, I went a little too far, sorry. Let's say Patricia here, she signed up for Google Slides Basics, using Google Forms, Google Drives and sharing permissions, Google Hangouts, Me, free screencasting tools. She signed up for five separate classes. All five of those showed up in the exact same column, in the exact same cell in my sheet. That made it an absolute nightmare for me to then use that data because what I should have been able to do, what I should have done is made that five separate questions so that each one would have shown up in its own column. I could have sorted them very easily. I could have sent out my meeting invites very easily. Um, it would have made it a lot easier on me in the end. Um, so that was my fault for doing it that way. But that's something that once you, um, you know, understand a little bit about how Google Forms works, you need to think about what are you going to do with the data after the fact and um, whether that is going to be a manageable, um, uh, your, whether it's going to be manageable for you to use it in that way based on the types of questions that you're asking the people to respond to. So we'll come back to this concept uh, when we get to uh, analyzing our forms in a little bit, but it's just something to be very cognizant of is that checkbox type questions, multiple responses from a person will end up in the same cell in your spreadsheet if you wanna uh, use that data that way after the fact. So other things that we may want to um, find out about, let's add another question here down to the bottom and let me zoom back up here a little bit. So maybe we want to know um, how far of a distance is it for them. So sometimes it doesn't do such a good job of picking their question type, right? So, you know, previously, it was making some pretty good guesses. This time though, probably more of a short answer type of a question. Maybe this one. This one was pretty good, probably a paragraph type of a response. We let, want them to be able to type in, you know, as much or as little as they want um, in response to uh, the survey itself. So maybe I'm up here working on this one. Maybe I decide um, after the fact that we need to add um, one. Some static coming from somebody. We decide to add one more question. So I hit my plus here. And I don't know, um, will you need accommodations? How about that? We'll do the same yes, no, maybe. What it did is it automatically just dropped that question um, in between the questions that I was working on at the moment. And maybe that's not really where I want it. Maybe I want that down at the bottom, okay? At the top of every single question box, as you hover over it with your mouse, you'll see this little set of six dots in the upper or the top center of the question. That's essentially your, uh, sort of handle that you can grab to then drag the question wherever you want it. So if I want to move this down to the bottom, I'm just clicking and now dragging all the way to the bottom here. Maybe I want it um, right in between these two, and now I can drop it in there. Similarly, if I had a uh, checkbox type of a question, so let me change this one from drop down back to um, checkbox. 
I can also rearrange my choices here. So if I want the um, plates maybe to be up here, I've got that same type of little handle that I can use to rearrange my choices as well. Let's see if I can, yep, and I can do that on other question types as well. It's not just check boxes. Even my yes, no, maybe, although I'd probably want to leave those, you know, in that order just logically. Other things I can do here um, with my little side toolbar is I can add a title and description. So, you know, I've already got my main heading at the top of my form um, talking about the family reunion, where it's going to be. But maybe later on in the form, I need to be descriptive about some additional questions I'm going to ask. I can hit this at any time and it will add um, somewhere. Where did it go? Well, it went way down here. It added uh, another sort of title box. So um, maybe I just fill in some informational stuff like that. It's not expecting them to answer a question, but maybe I'm just putting that as a, you know, a header above the will they need accommodations type of a type of a thing. I can also insert an image anywhere along the line. I can upload it, you know, from my local computer. I can go and find something from my um, photos list. It'll add that image in. Uh, yep, and I can resize it. So you can kind of jazz up your form if you want to. Um, if I don't want this on there anymore, of course, I can just, again, hit the delete and it'll take it back off. I can also insert a video if I wanted to in my uh, form. So, you know, if you were thinking about using this as some kind of a, um, of a testing tool or an assignment type of a tool, you know, you could put in a, a video clip, a discovery education clip, something off of YouTube, whatever, um, and then say, you know, after watching this video clip, you know, tell us, you know, tell us what you think, whatever. Um, just give them a paragraph type of question to respond to below that. So have them reflect, have them do some writing kind of a thing. So anyway, that's what uh, these different buttons are um, on the uh, toolbar here on the right. You can also add a section. That's the kind of looks like an equal sign down at the bottom of this menu. Adding a section is what you have to do if you're going to do any of the logic that I talked about earlier. So I'm going to come back to that. but. Um, Essentially, what will happen is if they say yes to this question, then you send them to a particular section. If they say no, you send them to a different section. So that's what the that sort of double lines at the bottom of the toolbar is. All right, let me check my slides and make sure that I'm not leaving off anything important here. So we talked about um, there's a whole bunch of different question types. Um, I've only covered probably half of the question types that are on the list. Um, you know, you can do a linear, linear scale, multiple choice grid, checkbox grid. Those ones you definitely need to do some experimenting with. This, you know, see how it's going to work, see what your responses are going to look like. Um, we talked about how to add more questions, multiple choice versus checkboxes, uh, drop down lists, uh, how to move the questions around. So we're doing well here. Uh, asking for email address. So this is uh, something we need to talk about. Let's come back to our family reunion form here. So you obviously could just add a question and make an email address and ask the, the people to fill that out. But up here on our settings menu, so the, the gear in the upper right here, if I click on settings, there's actually a checkbox that I can turn on to collect email addresses. If I turn that on, if the person is already logged into a Google account, it'll actually automatically grab the email address that they're logged in as and fill that in for them. So most of you probably when you signed up for this class didn't even have to type in your email address because you were already signed into your Google account anyway. It could have been your personal account or your work account um, and it would have automatically filled that in for you. If um, 
you turn this on and they're not automatically or already signed into their Google account, then it'll just simply give them a box to type in their email address and they'll have to fill it out. Response receipts, if I turn this on, then they can choose at the end of the survey whether they want to get an emailed um, receipt essentially saying that they completed the survey or I can set that to always. Um, I had a few people actually, you know, after they signed up, email me and say, hey, I don't remember, did I sign up or didn't I sign up? What did I sign up for? Um, so if I had turned on response receipts, that would have helped out with some of that. This next um, checkbox is a very important one for you to be aware of, especially if you're gonna send out a Google form to anybody outside your organization or like family members that are not necessarily students um, or even students if they're maybe not logged in or don't know what their school email address is. So by default, Google turns on this restrict to users in whatever your organization name is. If I leave this turned on and I send this form out, the only people that would be able to respond to it would be people that have a tuscolaisd.org email address. So most of you that are on the session today and work for other schools, you would have gotten a, a link to the form, you would have clicked on the link, and it wouldn't have let you fill it out anyway. So I almost always have to come in here and turn that off um, just because most of my surveys go out to, to people beyond just my organizational boundaries. So again, if you're going to send out a survey to families, if you're going to send out a survey even to your students, they would only be able to fill out the survey if they were logged in with their school email account. I can also choose whether I wanna limit them to just one response. Again, they would have to be logged into a Google account for it to know whether they've already responded once or not. Um, these two things, you know, uh, uh, an example or an idea of why you might use these, let's say you're gonna use a Google form to vote for the homecoming court. Um, we want to make sure that we're only allowing uh, students that are within your organization um, to be able to respond to the survey, and we want to make sure they can only vote once. So by turning on these two things, that would be a way of, of accomplishing that. Okay, I'm going to turn those off. Down here at the very bottom, we've got two more choices. Can the respondents edit after they've submitted? So if I turn that on, obviously it just means that they can come back to the same survey and modify their uh, answers. And do I want them to be able to see a summary chart and text responses? So the funny thing about this one is if you're like the first person to fill out the survey, there's really not going to be anything to see. If you're the 50th person, person to fill out the survey, there might be a lot of data for you to see. So, you know, I guess it's okay that you turn that on unless it's some kind of private information. Um, it just lets them see what other people have responded with as far as, you know, just summary type de uh, data. Um, but I'm not sure that it's terribly useful because it just depends on whether you're the first or the last to fill it out as to how much value you're going to get out of it. One other th area that I'm going to show you under settings is over here under the presentation tab. So under the presentation tab, we can choose if we want to show them a progress bar. So if you've got a super long survey, maybe it's multiple pages, do you want to be able, you know, have them see, oh, I'm 20% done, I'm 40% done, whatever, so that they hopefully stick with it and, and get through to the end. You can also shuffle the question order. So again, if you're giving some kind of a quiz or a test with this um, and you're going to be in a lab and students are going to be sitting by each other, you know, my question one could be your question five. And that way it's just cuts down on cheating potentially a little bit. And then lastly, do we want to show them a link to submit another response? So, um, you know, it depends on your survey as to whether it would make sense for somebody to want to uh, submit another response. If I think back to my Rumsey 10 thing where people can borrow items from our um, checkout library, um, you know, I'd want them to be able to come back and fill out as many responses um, as, as they wanted to. So in that particular case, it probably would make sense to, to leave that on. 
And I could also fill in a, a confirmation message um, at the end. Uh, they'll see something anyway, but um, you know, I could type in here, you know, please visit our website for more details or whatever I wanted to type in there um, would be available as well. So if I leave on the collect email addresses, let's now save these choices. I can see at the top that I do get now an email address field that automatically adds it as the very first choice. It's automatically required. Um, I can change those settings from here. If I go and look at my preview window, okay, they see something similar. Now, if, if the survey was actually opened, not just in preview mode, but actually fully opened by me right now, it would actually show my email address already up there. So let me show you that real quick. I'm going to close this. I'm going to grab the link to the survey, and we'll come back to this in just a second. <clears throat> I'm going to go to another window, and I'm going to paste that link in. And of course, it didn't do what I expected it to do. Generally speaking, what it'll do is it'll show my email address already filled in there, but I think it knows that I'm kind of in edit mode on the survey right now. Okay, so let me close back out of that. So we talked about how to shuffle questions. Um, you saw that under settings and presentation. Normally, I would have that off. Let me also show you how to shuffle the choices within a question. So again, if we're doing some kind of a test or a quiz and we're in an environment where everybody's close to each other, um, some question types, you can, using that little three dot menu in the lower right, tell it that you want it to shuffle the options as well. So even if I didn't shuffle the questions, if both you and I are on question three and I say, hey, did you pick A, B, or C for question three? Your A, B, C potentially would be in a different order than my A, B, C if I had turned on the shuffle option order, okay? So that type of uh, choice is available for some of the types of questions. I can see it, that it's available on a checkbox type question. I can see that it's available on a drop-down list question. It's also, I think, available, yep, on a, oops, where am I at? On a multiple choice type question. So any type of a question where there's multiple things to pick from, uh, checkbox, multiple choice, or um, drop down menu, you're going to see that type of a um, option to shuffle the um, shuffle the list, and it just does a random shuffle for you. Okay. Check this out again, see where we're at. We talked about that stuff. We talked about that stuff. Okay, so now let's make our form a little bit prettier. So, so far we've just been focusing on what we want to collect, the data, the um, responses we want to get and so forth. If we want to make it look a little nicer though, up here at the top, we've got a, looks like a little color palette where we can customize theme. If I click on that, you can just simply kind of change your color scheme, or you can hit choose image, and they've got a bunch of built-in ones. So I could pick from those. They've got them broken down into different categories as well. So maybe I want to pick an Easter theme. I tried this one the other day though, and it was like super slow for some reason. So I'm going to insert that. Just give this a couple of seconds, and if it doesn't uh, fill in right away, I'm going to pick another one because, like I said the other day, it was doing the same kind of thing. Usually it's within just a couple of seconds, and it fills out. So, nope, I'm going to refresh that, and we're going to pick something else. Let's see if it's just that one. Let's pick the uh, whatever this is. Yep, see that one came in pretty quickly. That's more normal. So it just puts that image up at the very top of your form. It automatically adjusts the color theme within to be similar to what that image is. So you can see a lot of purples and light purples and whites and stuff like that. Um, 
of course, I can also go back here and I can upload a photo from my local computer or I can go to photos, meaning that it goes and searches my Google photos. Let's say that I grab this um, particular picture here and insert it. Now, because of the fact that it wants it to be just that size, it's gonna let me sort of drag around within that photo to find specifically the, the part that I'm um, wanting to insert. I would select it, I would hit done. It'll take a few seconds. And then not only did it put that picture up there, but it also adjusted the color scheme based on what it saw the colors were inside of that photo. <clears throat> so it's pretty intelligent as far as that goes. <clears throat> okay. And again, if I preview it, pretty much they're going to see the same thing, right? The photo, the pictures as you would expect. All right. So that is how you jazz up your form a little bit. So the rest of today, we're pretty much going to focus on how you get the data back from the people and what you can do with that data once you've um, had them respond. So I can see right now on my responses tab that there are none. I can tell there are none because if there were some, there'd be a little circle right next to this with a number in it. Um, of course, I'm expecting there, there would be none because I haven't sent it to anybody yet. So we send it to people using the send button in the upper right. And there's three different ways we can put the data out to people. The default, the first tab here is to directly email them right from our Google form. <clears throat> so right here, I can literally start typing in people's email addresses. It populates from my, um, from my uh, Google address book. Um, if I've got uh, email addresses that are saved in a spreadsheet or in some other format, I can literally come in here and right click and paste and it would fill them all in for me as well. I could type in what the subject of the email is going to be. I would put a message into the form uh, to the body down here and then um, uh, it will automatically paste a, a link to that form as part of the message as well. Or if I check this box, it, what it does is it sort of embeds the form within the email. So when they get the, the message and they open it, they'll actually see the questions right in their email rather than having to click a link to take them to a separate page that has the form itself. My personal preference, though, is I don't send it out this way. It, it works. You're more than welcome to use it. Um, my preference is to go to this second tab up here, this um, hyperlink tab or URL type tab. And I grab this link or I'll click on this shorten URL and I'll grab this shorter version of the link, takes them to the same place. And notice I can press control C to copy. I can right click and say copy, or they give me a convenient little copy button over here on the right. I could just click on copy tells me it's copied to the clipboard. Now I can take that URL and I can put it wherever it is that I want. I could generate my own email right from my Gmail window. I could go to my plan book. I could go to my Facebook. I could go to Twitter. I could go to a web page if I uh, have the ability to edit a web page. I could go to um, a school messenger or something like that if you have the ability to push out an email or a text that way so i can now use that link in any of those formats that i have um, to blast it out to you know all of the families or all the students or all of my customers or whatever the case might be so i'll just copy this just to, to show you the example i'll go to my email i'll go to compose I would put in, maybe I wanted to go to everybody in our organization. Subject is, um, you know, whatever, staff meeting form. And then blah, 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 fill out whatever it is that I want them to know. And then I can right click and paste. And there's the link to that form. And when they got the email and opened their their email window, they would be able to literally click on that link and um, take them right to uh, being able to fill the form out. Uh, I had a question in yesterday's session 
it doesn't really look like it's a link right now. It doesn't turn blue. It doesn't give you the little underline, the hyperlink part of it. Um, when I hit send, it actually will automatically do that. But um, if I'm just wanting to be absolutely positive, I could highlight that. And down at the bottom of the screen here, I can click on the insert link um, button. And now it gives me a little bit warm, fuzzy feeling that, in fact, it is a link. It is going to work for them, um, that kind of a thing. Okay. But like I said, um, you could have sent the email out directly from here by going to the link page instead. It now gives you a lot more flexibility on how you broadcast that out to the masses. The last tab I didn't talk about yet here is actually, um, it's called an embed code. So if you are able to edit a website, um, there's uh, an ability for you to directly embed your form on the site. So when somebody clicks on your site and clicks on you know whatever tab or link you've got on your site, um, it would look like the form literally is embedded within your site. You would they would still see the the rest of your site all around it, your menus and all that kind of stuff, um, but the form would literally look like it's part of your website. So that's probably not going to apply to most of us. So that's how we send out the form, and then it's a matter of waiting. You know, um, are people going to respond? How many people are going to respond? Are we going to get a good um, you know, a good sort of sample um, from the different people that uh, that we're sending it out to. Let me show you on uh, my sign up form for this class. If I open that up, so I can visually tell that 195 people responded to this form just by literally clicking on that. Yes, I had 195 people sign up for these sessions, not just this one, but all of them. So I can click on my responses tab and it'll give me a summary. The summary is going to give me the whole giant list of all those email addresses. If I scroll down here far enough, let me go this way. All their names, the districts, and then you can see that it automatically built these charts for me. I didn't do this. It automatically did that from the data. So the people that would like to attend these sessions, we had, let's see, using Google Forms uh, today, we had 46 people um, sign up for that particular session. You Using, uh, what do we got here? Oh, originally I had the date wrong. So notice using Google Forms Wednesday 4-8, using Google Forms Wednesday 7-8. I had gone in and fixed the form after, I, after we caught that. So five people had signed up for the July session whereas 46 people signed up for the April session. So that's what that difference is. Um, other, this was a free form text box. People could type in, you know, what other um, trainings are you interested in? So I could see a quick summary without having to dig through all 195 of those responses. 25 of them gave me some kind of an answer to other trainings that they were interested in. So I could do a quick review of what those were. Now, from this view, a lot of people ask me, I tried to print this, I wanted the fancy charts, I wanted to, you know, take it to a staff meeting or department meeting, and, you know, it just didn't print very well. Some of the charts got split like half on this page and half on that page, and it didn't line up very well. And that is pretty much the way that it's intended to be. They this is not meant to be uh, a printable copy, really. Um, you can print from here. I could just right click and say print, um, but it's going to be not formatted very well. So what I suggest for you instead is if you wanted, for example, this chart and you wanted to paste that um, onto a document and have it formatted nicely, just go over and start a um, Google Doc. So let me go back to this folder. So I'm just going to say new Google Doc. And maybe it's my summary of my trainings. And I could come back over to my form, wherever it is. Here it is. And the nice thing they do for you is these charts. 
I've got this nice little copy chart button in the upper right. So I can click on that. It puts it out on the clipboard, just the same thing as me saying edit copy. I could now go back over to my document and I could paste that right into my Google Doc. I can also now, if I wanted to, resize it, um, you know, do any of those types of things. I could move it around within my document. I could make sure that I, um, you know, had it right, right where I wanted. I could put some additional text above or below it, um, any of those types of things. So um, let me show you another one that has um, multiple types of responses. So this one, for example, was one that I had done ahead of time. And I went in um, and responded to it myself 10 times. So it was the same kind of family reunion type of a, <clears throat> of a survey. But in this particular case, because I had multiple types of questions that were asking for sort of counts, <clears throat> you see that it gave me some pie charts instead. So will you be attending? I get a pie chart, 60% said yes, 30% said no, 10% said maybe. What are you going to bring to the potluck? I get way too much meat coming. 66.7% of the respondents said they were bringing meat, 16.7% um, soft drinks and uh, the others salad, but nobody's bringing water, nobody's bringing plates and that kind of stuff. But you can see that it automatically generated these as well and I could copy each one of these charts individually and do the same kind of thing. Just go back to my document, go wherever I want that chart to show up, paste it, and then it'll be there and I can you know, do whatever kind of fancy formatting and extra text around it that I need. So while it doesn't make it um, uh, easily printable from this view and formatted nicely, they give you a lot of nice tools to be able to easily copy and paste it into a document that you can do that formatting from. Okay, so that's the summary responses. I can also look at my responses by question. So if I flip over to question, I can see that I had four questions on my survey. Uh, the first question was name. So I can see that all the individual names, that probably doesn't really do me a whole lot of good. I can pull this down. I can see what districts. I can see, okay, 23 people from the ISD responded. Um, well, 13, well, so you can see how they responded differently though. So it, it counted those separately because it's not smart enough to know that Tuscola ISD and TISD are the same. Those were a free form type of a response that they could fill in, okay? So I can get that kind of summary data. I can see how many of them responded in any given way. So this is kind of strange to look at. This is basically just telling me that I think three people picked this exact combination and two people picked that exact combination. So not terribly helpful, I don't think. And then the other training topics thing, uh, we've kind of already looked at that. But I can see, hey, three people said specifically Google Classroom. It might be that more of them said that, but they said it again, you know, without just saying Google Classroom. Like this one didn't count up there because they typed other things as well. I can also see the individual responses. So I could look individually at all 195 responses just in the way they filled it out. So it's going to show me the exact form and specifically what they um, picked. I can see Rebecca Hopper and what she picked. I can see, you know, again, probably not something you're going to do. The power of this thing really comes then from the spreadsheet. So let me flip over to our family reunion one again, and let's look at the spreadsheet from there. So this green button in the upper right allows us to view our responses in sheets. By clicking on that, if I hadn't already built a sheet from this, it would now ask me, do you want to open um, a Google, a new sheet for this form? And I would just say yes, and this is what it would show me. What it does is every response shows up as a separate row. It automatically adds a timestamp, time and date. So that's always column A, it automatically appears. And then every question that you've asked is a column. 
So I can see we asked for email address. Question two was, what's their name? Will they be attending was question three. So I can see those headings up at the top in row one for what my question was and then how they responded to that particular question, okay? The nice thing about this now is I can do whatever kind of data analysis that I want to do on it. So maybe something I would want to do would be to sort my list. So I could do something like data, sort range. I want to sort it by will they be attending or not. I could say sort. It, ought, it actually sorted it probably in the reverse order from what I would have wanted. I could turn around and flip that the other way if I wanted to. Maybe go Z to A. So suddenly all the yeses are together at the top. Maybe I want to sort it by what people are bringing. So I can be sending out some emails or calling people and saying, hey, you know, we got way too many people bringing meat. Could you bring something else instead? Um, I could simply come in here and add up using like some function, how many people are going to come? You got 23. Now, I could have saw that or, or seen that from the um, some of that summary data as well, but um, these are some of the types of things, you know, just as examples that I can now do with this data once it's into a spreadsheet. The neat thing about it is that um, even if I manipulate any of this data, if somebody goes and responds to the survey after the fact, it will still continue to add to this spreadsheet automatically. So watch this. I'm going to leave this sheet open. I'm going to go back to uh, the survey itself, and I'm going to add another response to it. We've got 10 right now. I'm going to just go and respond one more time. This is what I was expecting to show earlier. See how it automatically showed my email address up there at the top? Will you be attending? No. I'm going to just leave it on choose because I'm not bringing anything. This is the black sheep of the family here, so we're going to hit submit. So if I go back to my form, I can see, look, we've got 11 all of a sudden. If I go back to my sheet, automatically it added another row. You can see today's date, this time, the responses I put in. So even though I was working on this sheet, even though I was making colors on it, I sorted it, I you know, did some totaling on it, it still continued to um, add more responses to that sheet. I'm going to show you one more thing here um, in Sheets. And this applies to any Google Sheet, but I think it's very helpful when it comes to a Google Form because let's say that it's a form that, um, you know, like my Ramsey form, somebody could sign up on that form any day, any time. I don't want to have to go and check it every single day to see if somebody's asked for something new. So in Google Sheets, I can go up here to Tools, and I can go to Notification Rules, and I can tell it to notify me at my email address anytime a user submits a form or any changes are made to the form. And I can also choose whether I want to get a daily digest, meaning that if 10 people respond that day, it'll only send me one email telling me 10 people responded. Or do I want to get 10 separate emails and I want to get that email as soon as somebody responds? So if I was to save this, that's what would happen. If somebody new fills out the form, it would um, immediately email me telling me, hey, you've got a new response. It doesn't tell me what the response is, but it does give me a link right in that email to go back to the form to see what the response was. So that's a very helpful tool if it's going to be kind of an open-ended survey and just every once in a while, you know, you're going to go in and do something with the, with the data. Okay, uh, we're running out of time here. Let me double check our slides and see what I've forgotten to tell you. We talked about how to get responses. We've talked about how to look at the data. Um, I've got a slide about how to do some sorting, um, so if you're not familiar with that, feel free to, to look at that. Um, I talked a little bit about the, oh, actually what I didn't talk about is this. So in your um, Google form, while we talked about 
it doesn't give you a great way to print your responses. Um, the questions themselves, if you wanted to, to create like a hard copy to distribute um, by mail or, you know, just printed copy to, to hand out in class, up here on the more uh, button next to send, the three little dots, I can tell it to print and let me see if I can zoom this in at all or not. It makes a nice printable copy. So see how it automatically put the little ovals next to the, um, and it tells them even mark one oval for the type of question that it was. Gives them some lines to fill in because it was a paragraph type question, just a single line if it was expecting just a single type of response. Um, so it, it can generate a pretty nice printed copy for the data collection. So that again was under the three dots called more in the upper right hand corner and then um, print. I'm going to show you one more quick thing. Um, I didn't get a chance to get into the, the logic part of it. Um, I do have a slide or two, um, I think, at the end of the presentation that talks about that. Um, but again, um, the logic would be found like here. We've got a multiple choice question. I could go to this and I could say, go to section based on answer. I have to have a section already built. So I would make my sections first. I would advise you kind of make like a little flow chart up. Like if they answer this question this way, then this is what I want to have happen. And kind of just get at least a visual idea in your head of how you want that to work. Build out the sections for it. And then that's how you sort of send them one direction or another is using the uh, little more options in the bottom right corner of the, the um, particular question. The other thing you can do with questions is um, in some cases you can set uh, um, sort of validation rules on them. So let me show you that really quick as well. Maybe we've got a question that's age specific. So maybe we're gonna ask them for their age. It automatically guessed that it was a short answer type of a question. And it actually even automatically suggested a response validation and it started it down here for us. We don't have to add that. We could accept any age we wanted. But let's just pretend for a second that we only wanted people that are, say, ages 13 to 16 to fill out this form. I could come down here and say response validation. And then I could say that it's got to be a number. And it's got to be between 13 and 16. And if they don't, what do we tell them? So we can fill out whatever we want there. And if we go up here and preview this now, <clears throat> we go to our age question. Let's say that I type in 13. No problem. It accepts it. Let's say that I type in 12. Pops up and it won't accept that answer. Only ages 13 to 16 allowed. Okay. So again, it can get pretty fancy, pretty complex um, with these kind of extra tools that are kind of hidden here and there. Um, so things to think about. So I apologize. I'm out of time. I've got another session starting in one minute. So I'm going to have to sign off. Um, the session recording will be available to you in your